It's Baseball Shangri-La with Amy Cuevas and Juan Ramirez. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Baseball Shangri-La. She is Amy Cuevas, and I am Juan Ramirez. And what you just finished listening to was the de- the debut the debut of the Baseball Shangri LA-, LA theme song. I'm, I'm having a hard time talking here. In the because you're not used to your ears not bleeding, Juan. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? We got we got compliments on the OG uh, Baseball Shangri LA theme song, but. And uh, uh, you can see his handle here. We want to thank AJ Padilla. AJ Padilla came through for us. We had put out a call. If anybody was interested in creating a theme song for Baseball Shangra LA and AJ Padilla came out, he answered the call. We love it. Thank you, AJ. Thank you very much. We love our theme song. So go out there and support AJ, everybody. Follow him. Uh, we have his handle here. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening to the audio, uh, you can follow AJ on Instagram at Sater Foo. So that's S A T E R F O O. I totally sounded like a white guy right there. So I'm going to say it the, the, the way we say it on the street, and that is Sater Foo. He's Sater Foo. Uh, anyways, AJ. And you uh, can thank him for, you know, making sure that we have a, a legitimate theme song now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like we're we're somewhat professional. We got a theme song now. We have these these great graphics. So, um, so this week's episode or this episode that you're listening to or watching, we're going to be focusing on Dodgers Fest. On Dodger Fest, Amy just corrected me. The whole weekend, I've been calling it Dodgers Fest, and it was actually Dodger Fest. So, um, Amy and I attended Dodger Fest. Um, we attended in the capacity of the media. So I think maybe our view of Dodger Fest was a little different than the fans. But Amy, being a season ticket holder, also did some fan uh, some fan uh, attending of Dodger Fest. Am I wrong there, Amy? No, I got to wear two hats. So one on the one hand, I got to represent the media, um, represent you know who I write for, make sure that we get all of that great content and get that out there. Um, but also as a season ticket holder, I got to take advantage of um, a meet and greet with Joe Kelly. So um, it was pretty, pretty amazing. So we're going to go and get into all of this. So, um, so first of all, from the media perspective side. So when Amy and I got there, um, all the Dodger player interviews were being held in the home bullpen. So when we got there, we just went straight to the home home bullpen and we started waiting until players became available for interviews. I ended up basically spending all of Dodger Fest in that bullpen. So I didn't even get a chance to see the stage. They they had a stage show where they were interviewing all the players. They were taking. I know Joe Davis was moderating some of those interviews. Um, and, DJ Severe uh, was up there playing all the music. Um, I don't know if you poked your head around, but I I did ask security if I could just kind of take a quick look around the corner just to see where the stage was this year because we were we were mostly corralled in that bullpen. No, I I didn't see any of that. I I, I didn't see the stage like so. From the bullpen, you could see the big screen uh, above the left field pavilion. So I was able, I didn't get a full shot though. So what I was able to see is they were sitting on nice white couches. I guess they were trying to make it like a talk show vibe. I know that when Shohei was being interviewed, Jose Mota um, was moderating the interview there. So, uh, and then Steven Nelson, I think, was also moderating at one point with, with uh, Joe Davis. So, but that was the extent, like walking into the Dodger Stadium, I saw they had the little carnival type stuff out in the parking lot. But in terms of what was, I, I saw a lot of fans sitting in the stands in the lower bowl um, of field level, and then some sitting in loge uh, by the foul pole. And they could but go I, on the field as well. Some fans were on the field. Um, there were a lot of tours and things being done. So not in addition to the meet and greets, there were tours. So, um, some fans were actually in the interview room where, uh, you'll see a lot of the, the post game interviews done with the TVs behind them. 
Um, some were doing tours throughout like the clubhouse, um, the press box. Um, there were even some where like the one that I was involved in, we were in the, the speakeasy over by the, the visitor's bullpen. Um, and then of course you had all of the, the sports net or the, the spectrum interviews that were happening kind of in that bowl in the center field plaza. So basically all the fans were around the center of, in those areas, then the center field plaza, then in the outfield or in the stands. Um, what did you hear? What was the verdict? Or when you got the actual opportunity to walk around be before you were going to the Joe Kelly experience, what did you, what was your take on Dodger Fest? There were so many people. I mean, I'm I'm sure in past years, there've been a lot of people, maybe because we knew the number this year because of the tickets sold, it just felt like more. Um, but there, I mean, there was a ton of people, even when I went over, I went straight from the, the home bullpen over to the visitor's bullpen. I just stayed underneath because the, the mass of people that were in the center field or even just in the, like the eatery areas, there were so many people just to, to get through. Um, I think the only fan interaction I had were with um, some Dodgers fans. I got to dust off my my ASL interpreter hat and let them know who was being, you know, who was coming up for the interviews. They, I was told they did have interpreters at the main stage, but because they were just waiting to to get eyes on their their favorite players, um, we had a list of who was coming up interview wise. So I was able to at least, you know, convey some of that information to them. And so shout out to Alma and and Kim. They were. Um, I know we're, we're working on getting subtitles on our shows, but they were amazing. We got to, to chat with them, but that was really my only fan interaction. I don't, did you talk to anybody else outside of the, the bullpen? No, I, I, I mean, I, I stayed in the bullpen and I was just busy focusing on trying to get as much interviews or get as much sound as I could from the players because they, they handed us a, a schedule in the beginning saying these players were going to be avail available from this time. And we got a little bit of a break. We got an hour break in between, but after that, it was like, boom, boom, boom. And it was, you know, from what, uh, from what the LA times was reporting. And I don't know if this is accurate. There were, they credentialed 180 journalists. So I, I don't know. That seems like it was a lot. Do you think there was 180 people in that bullpen? It didn't feel like we had, I mean, there were a lot of people, a lot more than are normally there, but it didn't feel like 180. Um, I know similar to last year, we had some of the same challenges, especially because of the sound. You have a lot going on in the stadium. Um, so as you're trying to get interviews, uh, you're also getting the background noise. Um, but there were a lot more people there, a lot more cameras. So trying to get in to get to the players, um, ultimately we ended up, you know, some people, especially the television, were doing a lot of their interviews in front of that backdrop. And then print media and everybody else would try to like snag a player off to the side and, and get the sound bites or interviews that you could just because there was so much going on in that tiny area. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't want to get too far away from this because I do want to give you your flowers, Amy. And that was that interaction that you were just describing uh, when you were doing uh, American sign language. Um, Amy had noticed we were in the bullpen and she had noticed that there were two women, right? They were signing, to one another right above the bullpen, those seats where you could sit there and they were overlooking the bullpen. And I think they were wondering who was going to be available, like what players would show up there. And all of a sudden I look over and I see that Amy is signing to them and she's signing to them. Like, who are you looking for? Who do you want to see? And it was just a reminder of how selfish I am in the sense that I never think about that. Right. I never think about someone um, that is uh, what's the proper term? I don't I don't want to be insensitive to, to this, Amy, like like access, someone, just accessibility. But do I refer to them as someone that speaks ASL? I mean, uh, teach my ignorance here. I don't want to be. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for the community because they, you know, the, it's ever changing. Um, uh, they were, they were fans. I mean, first and foremost, they were Dodgers fans. Um, right. they happened to, um, be deaf. I'm assuming, um, we were signing using sign language. There was, it looked like a family there. Um, and it was just, it was a, a way for us to communicate. So, um, being able to just share some of that information that we had down there, uh, because like I said, they did, it sounded like they did have two interpreters, or there were supposed to be two interpreters on the main stage. I didn't make it down over there, but in that particular area, you know, it's kind of a first come first, you know, serve whoever sits in those bullpen seats and then um, trying to figure out which players, especially some of the newer ones, you know, who is that as the, as the crowd clambers around them. 
So just See, doing my and, best to give them some access. <laughs> this is why I like working with Amy, because I'm going to say a lot of stupid shit. I'm going to say a lot of ignorant shit. And then Amy's going to be able to call me out on it and be like, Juan, they're people. You call them people. That's what you do. Uh, um, but anyway, I thought it was such a great moment. Uh, and it was just something I, I never really think about. And just the simplest things that I take for granted, being able to watch or listen to interviews with players. And there were a lot of players uh, that were interviewed. And, and a lot of them, I'm trying to think who wasn't there. Because the year before, Mookie wasn't there. A lot of the big names, Kershaw. Will Smith wasn't there. There wasn't a lot of Dodger players, but this year it seems like everyone was at Dodger Fest. I can't think of what Dodger player wasn't there. I mean, uh, yes, T. Oscar Hernandez was not there. Yamamoto was not there. But in terms of the, the big names that are associated with the Dodgers, all the big names showed up. Yeah, we. I mean, I was when I was writing my article, I was trying to go in order of like the, the the infield to the outfield, and we had somebody like essentially for every spot. I mean, we had a ton of even just the relievers, the pitchers, starting pitchers. Walker Bueller was there. Um, it, it we there were so many people there. I I think that was why it was kind of such a um, so much just organized chaos because you had like groups of five that were coming in at any given point. You know, you've got. Sheehan, Grove, um, I think it was Hurt, and um, and then followed by uh, Stone, and then Fiducia, and and Frasso, and then you know Freddie Freeman's coming in with Jason Hayward, and you know they're they're saying hey to Andre Andre Ethier and um, you know Walker Bueller, like there was so much going on down there, and that's not even adding in the Otani factor of of the day. Yeah, and it, and it was great because, uh, like I said, he, I don't think it was like that the year before. Um, this year, and I don't know if that is just the excitement because we've been seeing this a lot. We've been seeing there's a lot of video out there on social media of players working out at Dodger Stadium. You see the Shohei working out at Dodger Stadium. Gavin Lux is working out at Dodger Stadium. So it, it, it seemed it was a big contrast and maybe this is the excitement of them wanting to start the season uh, earlier uh, or just getting the, ready to, to start the season. But I was very surprised by the number of players um, that were there and who spoke to the media. Now, in terms of what was actually said, I don't think there was anything new, anything groundbreaking. I think what we learned is that Nick Frasso is going is out for the season. Um, so I, I think that was about the extent of anything new that that we learned um, there. Did you learn it? Am I missing anything, Amy? I mean, they confirmed what we already had been kind of assuming with Walker Bueller that he would have that delayed start. Um, I think something to kind of go back to your other point to keep in mind, too, is we've had some pretty irregular off seasons the last couple of years. We had the one leading into 2020 where everything was normal and then all of a sudden the world stopped. And then, you know, we're going into the the year where we had the lockout. And then last year we had the quiet off season. So there hasn't really been any consistency or anything to get really excited about until this year. And then this year, as we all know, the off season has kind of taken on a life of its own and the season hasn't even started yet. Um, yeah. I mean, the, in terms of the Dodger fest itself, I'm curious, I, I haven't heard any reports. I know they were selling, I know they were selling drinks and were they also selling full concessions? Was there food? I, I believe so. I didn't make it out that far. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I don't know if the prices were the same or what. I I haven't heard any fans say anything. What I have seen was I did see a lot of fans with bags of, of the memorabilia. I saw a lot of bobbleheads. Uh, be, they were signed baseballs. And I know a lot of it were some of the experiences that you could pay for to get there. So it did seem like a lot of Dodger fans were getting their swag. Um, there was another Dodger fan that I did talk to and she liked, uh, she thought it was great. But then again, she was there with her friend who was a season ticket holder. And as Amy can attest, I think the season ticket holders get some perks that not the rest of us Joe Schmoes got. So for this person, because she was attending Dodgers Fest with a season ticket holder, she thought it was a great experience. Uh, have you heard anything different? 
Um, I I haven't. I know that my best friend and her husband went. They took advantage of the the garage sale that the Dodgers had, stocked up on some bobbleheads, some rings, you know, a lot of the like the giveaways for the season where they had overstock. So um, definitely took advantage of that. I heard there was some art being created and passed out. Um, so from what I heard, aside from just the the mass amount of people, they had a really good time. And and that yeah you're right I should have said that there was uh, they were calling it a yard sale right it kind of is yes what they were yard doing. sale <laughs> so yeah there were and I was wondering what that was so it was just all the overstock from from the promotional giveaways from last year because they had it out in the parking lot and I'm sure they made a killing but I mean I saw we saw Danny uh, 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 but how does he go by on social media as a fan Dodgers fan, fan eighty eight. Um... Yeah, he was he was out there. I know um, Hillary mentioned that um, they they had personal shoppers for them. So like to oh. kind of make the line go by a little smoother, make the experience smoother for all fans. Um, they like they kind of they had tablets out there. So it sounds like they had a, a pretty smooth flow going. Um, so, yeah. Well, I mean, if you believe what they say, uh, that they sold 35,000, I will say this, when I was leaving the stadium, it felt like it was a Dodger game because it took me a while to get out of the stadium. Did you get that same experience? Oh, yeah. I wound around the stadium. I was probably like just on the back streets for like a good 20, 20 or so minutes um, before I even hit the freeway. And that's that's best case scenario. <laughs> Yeah, and and the thing is, is so like people w showed out. Now, was it a full thirty five thousand? I don't know, but it did feel like there was a lot of people there. the The excitement was there. One all the, the Dodger gear everybody was wearing, like you could see all the outfits, like people dusting stuff off, bringing it out for the season. Like it was good to see. And the new merch. There was a lot of merch. Of course, a lot of Shohei merch. There were, I saw some Yamamoto merch. Uh, so, I, I mean, they're getting ready. Um, the other thing from our point of view that was very noticeable was when Shohei come out. I mean, I've never been close to a rock star. Okay. I've never been in a concert venue. But the way this guy was walking around Dodger Stadium, like... He has his translator with him. He has, there's Dodger security. There was police also with him. Like this guy, the, the only thing I could equate it to is uh, one time I went to a WrestleMania event and Snoop Dogg was entering a room and he had his own personal bodyguard and the bodyguard would come in and he would just yell, clear the way, clear the way. And it was just basically, we need to get out of the way because Snoop Dogg needed a clear path, right? To walk. That's what it was with Shohei. And, you know, Shohei, you know, talked to the media and then he went on stage and he, Jose Mota interviewed him. And I'm sure there was some familiarity there because when Jose, when Shohei started his career with the Angels, uh, Jose Mota was still working there. So I don't think it was an accident that they chose Jose Mota to moderate with Shohei. But, one of the things that I and we're going to get into this uh, further along when we talk about other events that uh, took place this week. But because he's like surrounded by so much security, I, I, I wonder how how that is going to affect the rest of the team. Now, from all accounts last year, uh, I had heard all the Angel players thought Shohei was a great teammate. There was nothing but love. But I do feel. Like, this has got to be something that they need to get used to just now. Is he going to be traveling with that much amount of security when he's around the clubhouse? No. But when they do go on the road, when they do make events like this, it, it did. I, I don't know. Maybe it's me, but I found it a little jarring to see the amount of security, the amount of police is walking with him. And it was just clearly like, get the hell out of the way. Shout out to the security and everybody who had to be on their toes all day long. Like they did a they did a great job. Um, security, like the who handles the the media department, like great job. Um, but yeah, it was anywhere from like it had to be like eight to ten or even ten or more people surrounding him at all times. 
um, just making sure that he was kind of in his own bubble, which we see that we know that it's it's probably necessary with with the level of stardom he's at. But I start to think of things like how how isolating is that? Like you, how do I get to be around some of my teammates and have it be natural without you know them? Maybe maybe they do think I'm a great teammate, but are they frustrated that anytime the media puts a microphone on their face, they're asking about Shohei and it's like. Hey, ask about me. And I'm sure the team gets it. They're gracious about it, but it's got to be isolating in its own way. See, this is again, the reason why I do the show with Amy, because she's the smart one. That's what I was trying to say, but I couldn't find the words. And, <laughs> and you're absolutely right. The, the isolation that I, and I can't imagine, I, and I don't know if this is true, but does he feel that I can't be with my teammates because I, I have this, I, and yeah, it, it does feel like he is in a bubble. So if you are in a bubble, how can you get close? And maybe that's going to be established in spring training. Again, when you're on the field, none of this is a public event. So, and, and I get it because, you know, we live in a world where there's crazy people. And so you can't, unfortunately, just allow free access. I mean, we're going to get into it in some of the other events that took place. Uh, but that was, I think, thank you so much for uh, being able to express. And this is why I host a podcast, people, because I don't know how to speak. I can't say words. I have Amy who comes in, but that's exactly what it is. It, 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 the we both isolation. have our skills. We both complement each other. <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> so I, I want to talk to you about you got a chance to attend a what would you call it? A um, It wasn't necessarily a one, one-on-one -on -one with Joe Kelly because there were other Dodger fans, but an experience, let's say, with, with Joe Kelly. What was that like? So it was a meet and greet similar to what they were providing for the, you know, the other members of the team. So they did sell some of those experiences. This particular one was only available to season ticket holders. Um, and it was just, it was basically a QA and a and then an opportunity to, you know, get a picture taken with him, have, have something autographed, but just have that kind of small 30 to 35 people in the speakeasy room, um, just getting to, to ask him questions. And it, it was, it was very intimate and it was really neat because there were just things that we have questions about that, you know, we, we got answered. So, you know, ev all of the people in there got to ask their own questions. So like somebody had asked, um, would he be doing now that he's number 99, would he be, you know, playing the wild thing song? And, and he confirmed that it won't be for the whole year but that it, that it will be for a month or two um, and it will be complete with the haircut. So that's something that we can look forward to within the season. And then he's going to have other songs that might play off of either the number or whatever he wants for, for his walk up or his pitching song. Um, but he like, there was just, there were so many great questions in there. Um, I got to ask a couple questions. Um, I asked like, how does he mentally keep his edge um, when he's, when he's out there, we all know how they, they perform, you know, physically, we see them when we go in, you know, before a game or whatever's posted online. He said that a lot of people have their own routines, but his routine is a lack of routine. So it just, it was nice to kind of hear his explanation in his own words. Um, but he basically just confirmed he's always the same on and off the field. And so if you, I don't know if you've read his book or, or any of you out there, but he'll talk about that a lot in the book too, about how he just, he is who he is. And there are some people in his opinion who will show up and they will say what they need to say for the media or that's how they've been coached. And he will just be himself. So there was a lot of really, really neat um, things that he just shared. Uh, also mentioned that in comparison was the, the Boston world series, uh, a harder world series to win versus the 2020 with, with the Dodgers. And he mentioned that, you know, they both had their challenges, but as much flack as, as Dodger fans and Dodger players get for that world series win in 2020, he said it was much harder with the bubble, with the different ways of training, the shorter amounts of games, but more being asked of them. And I don't think people always consider that when they call it a Mickey Mouse world series. And Everybody's going to have their opinion, but that's something straight from one of the players who participated and, and played a big role in it. So um, I think the only other things that really stuck out, he did mention, because of, of course the Porsche got brought up, um, that Otani had mentioned that he was 8% of the reason that he signed with the Dodgers. So very specific number there. Um, but he loved the videos. So that was partially something because Otani was concerned about uh, Kelly having to give up his number. So numbers are very important to baseball players. Otani was concerned about that. But once Ashley 
Kelly released all those videos, it made it that much easier for him to make the decision. So he said it factored in as as 8%. Do we know how he came up with that number of 8%? Um, I He alluded to Otani telling him that. So um, <laughs> so out of that, that whole 100%, 8%, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good chunk <laughs> to be a part Just of when everything else considered. I mean, it's so funny because Joe Kelly is just such a great character. I mean, after all, there is that mural of Joe Kelly now inside of Dodger Stadium up in the rever- reserve section on the left uh, left field side. We uh, did talk about those, too. <laughs> what did he what did he have to say about the murals? He's he's not a fan only in that just it's not his thing. And like when even when he was approached about the pouty face mural in I think it's in gosh, is it Silver Silver Lake? Um, he thought it was going to be something small. And then uh, Jonas had mentioned Jonas Never, who painted it, was like, no, no, it's going to be a whole wall. So for for Joe Kelly, it was like, all right. I mean, I guess. But he said like to him, it's it's just not his thing. You know, it's funny because I think people just view him as a, a, an attention seeker. And it's just not that vibe, right? It's just he – I think what happens is is his honesty and he just him being true to himself – that's what ends up getting attention. And I, I, I know some of you may have seen this video uh, when he started doing the Crip Walk at his old high school in, in Corona. I, I mean, that's who Joe Kelly is, man. He allows he's not putting a facade. He allowed everyone to see like he should. He is just himself. Uh, that is one of the things that I don't think the Dodgers get enough credit for. Because before Dodgers Fest and some of these other events that we were going to talk about, they do this community tour. And I forget what the uh, the official title is of, of it. Is it is it the Dodgers? Uh, com- is it just the Dodgers community tour? Is that what it's called, Amy? Or um, let me double I, check. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it has the word love included in it. Or maybe I'm just misremembering it. But they do this the where they do events like they were at Jack in the Box serving, you know, customers. You pull up to the drive through window and all of a sudden, hey, there's Joe Kelly giving me my order. And I know some of the younger guys, I think, were working behind the counter and in the kitchen. I know they did an event at at Universal Studios. Do you have it? I don't want to. Yeah, wanna it's, the, it's the Dodgers community tour. Yeah, it's just a Dodgers community. But I mean, that kind of stuff, I think we do take for granted the fact that and I see fans, they see, oh, my God, he's a Dodger. I, you see little kids, you see grown adults. All they want to do. Oh, can I take a picture with you? Can I, you know, and and that's going to be like because it's much harder to do that when the once the season starts. OK, it's not the same when. Like you show up early before a game because by the time they open the gates at Dodger Stadium, it's the visiting team that's out taking batting practice. They're the ones out on the field. So you don't see any Dodgers. So the opportunity for you to get an autograph or to take a a picture, there's just not a lot of that. So that's why when they do these events, these community tours where the Dodger players are out there mingling, I I think it's a great way to, to start and putting people, the idea in people's heads, like baseball is coming very, very soon. What are your thoughts on the community tour? Um, I think it's great. I think it's exactly like you said, uh, even one of the season ticket holders who was in the meet and greet with me, he was the guy who has kind of gone viral on on social media for having number order number 99 and yeah. Joe Kelly calling him out as a liar. And, and it's like, no, no, I really did. Um, but he was in there, too. Like this is this is that opportunity even. So some season ticket holders do get that early access to go in and see the batting practice before, you know, you see that visitor side. And some of my like one of the things that I love about Joe Kelly being himself is sometimes you'll see him out there with his son Knox and they're just they're taking their fielding balls out there while, you know, the guys are are taking BP. And it's just you get to see that interaction. And he really he really is so down to earth. And I think you're right. Like we don't see that with a lot of other players. They're they're trained to be so polished in front of the camera. And not that Joe Kelly isn't polished, but just, you know, perform this certain way because that's the safe way to go. And and Joe Kelly just like one of the things he was saying was um, one of his mottos, especially in the postseason, care less. 
I got to care less than, than the batter who's at the plate. So if I, you know, if anybody's feeling pressure, I need to tone it down at that moment. And I need to care less because they're the ones that are going to psych themselves out. They care more. And that's not what you would typically hear in a baseball setting, mm -hmm. like with all the pressure and everything that's on. And, and this is his mentality and, and he's succeeding with it. Well, I mean, I think that's what happens is like, yeah, that's where the, I think the phrase you're trying too hard comes from, right? It, or you, a lot of times say, hey, hey man, you're overthinking it. Just go get in there and let your instincts take over. Just do. I mean, this is why these guys practice. Guilty. Right? So guilty of that. <laughs> I could, I could well, afford to care less. <laughs> but this is why guys practice, right? I mean, why everyone practices it's muscle memory, right? You do it where it just becomes natural and you are, you're just reacting to plays instead of well, well what I'm going to do here, but you're right. I mean, I think we're all guilty about this in life. Um, it was a very busy weekend. I, I got to spend a lot of time with Amy the, uh, this weekend and that. So not only at the beginning of the week, you had the Dodgers community tour, but then you had Dodgers Fest. And then after Dodgers Fest, Amy and I were able to attend uh, Mookie Betts bowling event. And I know a lot of people are like, ah, oh, Mookie bowling. Look, the guy likes to bowl. Let him bowl. He's raising Let money. the man bowl. <laughs> he, he's raising money. And uh, there's one thing, I, and, and we haven't talked about this, but one of the things that I was surprised about, because this is the second time Mookie's done this event here in, in Los Angeles. And I went to it last year. Uh, and I, 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 I was surprised by the fact that there weren't that many teammates that went to the event last year. Well, this year he did the event on the same day as Dodger Fest. And I wonder if that was by design because there were a lot more Dodger players that showed up to support Mookie in this event than they were last year. And what was also surprised me was there wasn't really that much media there. So we got to talk to basically everyone. We got to talk to every Dodger player that decided to walk uh, down the red carpet. And it, it, it's something that I noticed more, I, as the weekend progressed and that is, and we talked, I talked to Evan Phillips about this at the event and Evan Phillips had said that, you know, attending Dodgers Fest, doing this event with Mookie, doing the community tour, this is an extension of spring training. This is, it's a team building exercise. It's them spending time together and this is how you build chemistry. And one of the things I really noticed is it seems like these guys really enjoy hanging out with each other. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate to wins, but I always hear everybody say, oh, well, they don't they lack chemistry. You, you need chemistry to win. W were you seeing this, uh, some of that also, Amy? I think that's kind of a throwback to what we heard last season. Like they do a lot of stuff together you know, whether it's baby showers, events, charity, things that they come in and, and support each other. I think that's going to carry over this year. And, and obviously we lost some people to free agency or trades, but it's good to see that they're still gelling. Like we, there were so many people that, that walked that red carpet to get into the event. And then um, we briefly got to go in, in the back and just, you know, try to get some, some content and some shots so we could see them interacting with each other. You know, you could see the, you know, Sheehan and, I think it was Sheehan and, and Bobby Miller or Outman taking pictures together. And, you know, Freddie Freeman and Jason Hayward are sitting next to each other waiting for their turn. And Rojas is going up to, to bowl. And it's just they're having fun together. It's not an obligation of like, I have to show up to this event and let, let me put in my time and then let me go. It's they look like they genuinely enjoy each other's company. Yeah, that would that to me is what was and the thing that I thought was really interesting also was just how open I mean, look, I was even tired of hearing them after spending all day, you know, listening to them talk at Dodger Stadium. And here I am talking to them again. And it's like, now what are we going to talk about? I, look, when Tyler Glass now shows up, I mean, I did not realize how tall that guy is. I mean, that guy and then the hair. The hair is so intimidating because, I mean, his hair is literally perfect. He is like a walking head and shoulders commercial. And, like, he was just so open. He was just, and it was just all of them. And I think 
what was interesting was when talking to Blake Trinan, you know, Blake Trinan reminded everyone that it was like, look, I was hurt last year. So yeah, I didn't have a chance to talk to the media as much. And, and that guy seemed like he was a guy who was comfortable talking with the media. So it, it, it was great. It's and it's also, you see him in the in the clubhouse too. Like Blake would be there a lot of times with the team, but because he wasn't playing, nobody was really seeking him out to go, you know, grab an interview real quick, or he wasn't one of the the focuses of the the media scrum kind of moving that way. One of the things that I did find interesting, and I wasn't expecting him to show up there, uh, was if Shohei would have showed up to Mookie's uh bowling event. Because if Shohei would have shown up. I think it would have been the same thing, right? We we see him with the mountains of security surrounded by police. But I I he'd I have to I, show I w- up in a hoodie with sunglasses, like a disguise or something. We were we were chatting about that where it's like there's no way he could have showed up as himself. Not in that yeah. it, it was a it, it was a big place, but it was it was not big enough to house the Shohei excitement. I've always wondered that in those situations, if, if Shohei just goes, Hey man, I can't go. I'm just going to send you a check. All right. I'm I'm just going to give money. I, I just, because you're right. I mean, if this is for me, everyday life, I got to go do, this is everything I have to go through just to go out there. But it would have been very interesting because I think with this guy, and I talked about this with some of the players, the deferrals, like what is, like deferring that amount of salary, like what does that say to you? And I, I think the fact that that guy was showing up at Dodger Stadium already going through workouts. I, I mean, I've already seen the pictures. He's already in Arizona, mm-hmm. so it was like once he, he finished his commitment to show up to Dodgers Fest, he went to straight to Arizona. And that guy, I don't know if you saw the picture of him with the scar uh, yeah. on his elbow. Yeah, that did show up. I mean, but that's, that's what's going to happen when you have surgery. Like he's still putting in the work. He puts in the work every day at Dodger stadium. Now he's going to do the same thing at, um, in, in Arizona. He was even saying like, he's ready to ramp up. They're going to look at what it might look like for him throwing in 2025, but they're more focused on getting him geared up so that he can debut in, in uh, Korea when, when we have that opening game. I mean, the the other thing that I really liked about the fact that, like I said, there were a lot of people there that went to to support Mookie. And it's a, a we can't lose sight of the fact also that there are Dodger players here that are doing stuff to help their communities and especially the communities here in in, in, Los, in Los Angeles. And I, I again, it's another human aspect. And it's something that I think on this show we want, we really want to make an emphasis of in that it's just like, yes, they're players and they're here to entertain us. And we want to, you know, just give us baseball, but it's like, these guys are out there. They have, they have the ability to do something that maybe not the rest of us can do. And not everybody is out there. Not every player is doing a foundation like that. All I'm saying is for the amount of shit that Mookie gets, for bowling or going zero for 10 or whatever, and taking the collar in the playoffs. There's more to this guy. This guy is trying to, I just feel like sometimes this guy just, he catches strays where it's like, he, I was like, this guy just can't do anything right. It's like, whatever he does is not good enough. Yeah, it's un- it's unfortunate because he, I mean, he, he, him and his wife were both speaking about the event itself and, you know, what they're doing. Like, I have my notes out here. Like, the net proceeds, they're also partnering with the, the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation. They're supporting the Brotherhood Crusade as part of 50 Feeds LA. And then also a lot of the baseball field imp- improvements at John Muir High School in Pasadena, which is also the high school that Jackie Robinson went to. Like, how how great is that to have somebody who could just show up, collect a check, and go play? But instead, they're putting that effort into the community and and making it better for for the kids that are going there now who are going to be coming up and who, you know, one day may end up in in the majors if if they're lucky and things go their way. I want to end the show with this because so not only I mean, Saturday was a really long day for us. We we were at Dodgers Fest all day and then we went to the Mookie uh, Mookie Betts bowling event that night. But Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, Chris Taylor, who has his foundation again, yeah, Chris Taylor is one of the the. Uh, you can't say anything bad about Chris Taylor. I mean, I don't think 
I, I, I talked to him at the Mookie Betts event and I was just like, it, the guy is just incapable of thinking of bad thoughts. So he has his foundation last year. He did an event at top golf. Uh, I w- I attended that event. Uh, so then this year, I think they, they decided to change it up, which I thought that was smart. I think a lot of these guys, they do golfing events. I think they're like, let's try something different. So what they did was this thing called a polar plunge. So they went down to Manhattan Beach and they were all going to. And I know you guys have probably seen the videos all over social media. They were going to jump in the Pacific uh, Ocean uh, over by Pier 2 in Manhattan Beach. And again, the number of players that came out to support him. And what was so great was they're getting ready to do the, 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 the plunge. And I guess Mookie was late and they refused to go and. Here's the other thing. You know who was leading them towards the ocean? Dave Roberts. Dave Roberts was the going in there. And that's something I, I think I heard Dave S.A. said this. Like, what other manager, you know, participates in all this stuff? And I, I think, again, Dave Roberts has a reputation of being a player's manager. And I think this is part of the reason why he has that reputation is that he this engages is why him. they'll follow them, him, though. Like, this is why they follow him. This is why he's such a good manager. Whatever else anybody has to say about the analytics, about the postseason, he is a good manager. Like, th- and this is why these guys follow him and respect him. Yeah, and I mean, he was he was at Mookie Betts' event also. So it's like Dave Roberts is out there supporting his players. So they're getting ready. They're all, where's Mookie? Where's Mookie? They're waiting for Mookie. Mookie finally shows up. And it was like the minute they saw Mookie was there, Bruce Dar and Bobby Miller, they're heading into the ocean. And I know you saw Alex Vessia. Vessia had a GoPro as he was going. Like Vessia was acting like a maniac running it and running into that water. That was my favorite. Seeing his footage later, I think the the Dodgers even took the GoPro image and edited it themselves. Like he it this is this is the fun that we're missing in baseball like baseball is great it's a sport it has rules that's what we love about it we follow it there's tradition but i think we're also missing that joe kelly side that bringing that human aspect to it and i really hope that this translates to the team i want to see these guys on the field we see it sometimes in the dugout when they're playing before a game but like i want to see it on the field and not just with our team with all the teams, like you'll see a thing here or there. Somebody will like, you know, get a single and they'll, whether it's with Freddie or whoever's on first base, they'll have like a little interaction. But those are the things that make the game human. I want to see more of that across the sport because it's, it's just great. We're, we're all humans. Why not see that play out? Yeah. And, and so the thing is about the Chris Taylor polar plunge is the players were leading the plunge, but they were also people who, paid to participate the regular civilians regular fans they paid to be a part of this and this I is one of the you might have participated too did i did i get that wrong I, I i didn't participate if i did participate it was reluctant i was the idiot who decided to go to the beach in jeans and wearing tennis shoes because look it, it was supposed to rain so i thought for sure i don't know how i'm going to film this I don't know how I'm going to do this because if it's raining, all my equipment is going to get wet. I didn't, I don't want to be carrying an umbrella because it's just going to mess up the shot. And I was by myself. Right. So I wanted to get good footage. So I wanted to get a shot of them before they went into the ocean. And what I didn't realize is the tide just kept coming in closer and closer. Next thing I know, I have my back to the ocean and uh, my ankles are are way. It's going up to my knee. And at that point, I was just like, what? You know, I was with John Suhu, the great Dodgers photographer. Sue, who was in there getting wet and all that stuff. There was this poor bastard who was wearing Jordans and his Jordans just got sucked. At least I wasn't that stupid, to, you know, to, to wear Jordans on there. But as I was walking around shooting this, Amy, because they you could mingle all the people who were participating the fans, they were all on the beach mingling with Dodger players. And I saw players walking up to, I mean, fans, excuse me, walking up to Blake trying and, Hey, can I take a picture? Having conversations with him. You know, who was another player that was very approachable with terms of fans was Tyler Glasnow. Like people were walking up to Tyler Glasnow and Glasnow was talking to them. It, it was just, 
it, I think that was probably a perfect send off for them to go to spring training. I again because it was something new. I it has to be these wonderful team bonding exercises that they're doing, and they're probably going to have more of them in 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 Camelback in Arizona for for spring training. I just like I said, it all of this feels genuine. I feel this hopefully will translate. It's very, very hard to have everything go right throughout a 162-game season. They had a fantastic offseason. So far, to kick off these events, there have been so much fun. And, and like I said, I I have been so surprised by, by how candid these guys have been talking to everyone that – I, I hope that maybe I know we've talked about this before. What happens in the postseason? Do they tighten up? Maybe if this this is something that can keep them loose throughout the year, that again, we were talking about muscle memory, right? It's just, it's just reacting that they don't get tight when the playoffs come, that it it is just we everybody's got my back. If I can't get a hit, the guy behind me is gonna get a hit. So I think I think that's important to remember. And I think also even just obviously not everybody can go participate in these events. Um, not everybody has the the funding or whatever to to go ahead and, and donate to all of this stuff. But I think it's it's great that we do have people out there that are capturing this footage because it does allow some of us who can't be at those events to participate via social media. You know, for all the the flack that social media gets, there are, you know, some not so stellar people out there. These are some of the things that are on the positive side of it, like Alex Vesia taking a GoPro and getting to see that image of not only, you know, the media's images, but his images and them just having fun. We all get to participate vicariously. And I think that's just it's something wonderful across the fan base, because obviously not everybody uh, gets to have the same experience every time. Yeah, and I know the local affiliate for Fox uh, Channel 11 was there, but a lot of the footage that I saw on social media were were done by, I don't know if you want to call them independent journalists or if you want to call them new media. I'm, I'm going to save this topic for another episode because I do think. Uh oh. Looks like we've got a little bit of an Internet hiccup. So I'm sure we'll we'll take this topic to another time. Um, all right, we got one back. You gotta love the the storms and it knocking out our our internet connections. <laughs> okay, so that what did you last so, hear for me? I, I'm sure it was all of your wisdom, um, but basically another <laughs> a topic for another time. But all of your your wonderful insight, uh, you know, we'll we'll catch yeah. it on on that later episode. <laughs> For those of you who uh, aren't aware of what's happening, uh, we had Pineapple Express happening here in California, and it's pouring where I'm at right now. So I guess I lost my internet because I, I could I could still see you, Amy, but it's probably better that no one could hear my gibberish anyways. Uh, <laughs> but what I wanted to say was that's going to be saved for a different show, this conversation of uh, new media versus the old traditional way uh, of covering things. I mean, you and I, whether we want to admit it or not, we're part of new media. You know, this is I was this just is having this conversation with somebody last night. So <laughs> very apropos. <laughs> so like I said, we're going to save it for another uh, episode. But as you can see, if you're watching us on YouTube, here are our handles. Uh, you can follow us on X at BB Shangri LA uh, on Instagram threads and Twitch. We are at Baseball Shangri La for those of you listening on the audio portion. Um uh, hopefully you got all that and you listened to it. Uh, I just want to thank you guys. We just had our launch. This is our fourth episode. We had a fantastic reaction from you guys this weekend on the official launch of this podcast. And we can't thank you enough. And all we ask is please continue to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on our social media. Subscribe to the podcast, to the audio portion of it. Tell your friends. Refer everybody. Look, this is going to be an exciting season of Dodger baseball, and we want to share it with you guys. Uh, Amy, any last words before we end the show? 
I was just going to say, I know we didn't really get to connect too much with fans like around the stadium because normally we we will make the rounds. And this year, we like I said, we were mostly corralled in that bullpen, but we'll be at games throughout the season and we're going to host lives on either YouTube and that Twitch handle that you just saw. So we're looking forward to getting to interact with you, too. So you guys aren't just listening or watching to us. We want you involved, too. We want to create a community. Absolutely. This is going to be an interactive right now. We're just figuring out the, you know, ways for my internet not to go out. I don't know. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see the panic on Amy's face when she saw me disappear going, Oh no. I, Great. I don't, this is just like my day job. Here we go. <laughs> don't, don't leave me alone out here. So <laughs> this has been an episode of baseball Shangra LA. She is Amy Cuevas and I am Juan Ramirez. We want to thank you for listening and Hey, We'll catch you next time. Thanks for hanging out with us. Bye, everybody.